information resources and faster and more reliable technology. Higher performance communication resources and data analytics. Uh, that's kind of my passion in InfoSec. Um, I have only 30 minutes to cover a lot of data, a lot of information, so um, I'm going to go quick. I'm not going to go over uh, what Splunk is, uh, not going to go over the architecture of Splunk. Um, I'll figure you can go to Splunk.com or whatever and look at that stuff. I'm going to focus on applications, uh, writing your own custom apps. Um, I will at one point touch on where the apps reside in the architecture, um, but I'm not going to go through all that. Mainly I, I use custom apps to handle the massive flow of data. Um, I love Splunk because you can throw just anything at it, um, unstructured data, whatever, um, and, and just drown yourself in data. But I like to be able to get it you know, un under control and start, and start wrangling with it. Um, one of the things I love about Splunk is um, it seems to be designed for the way at least my mind works, f uh, security teams. So to be able to pull information out, I don't, I don't know what it is, but it just makes sense from more of a security standpoint versus like a business intelligence standpoint. Um, so I'll cover some of that. If you have questions at any point, go ahead and ask. I'll ask at the end of the, if you have questions, but go ahead and fire away anyway. So first thing I want to talk about um, is very foundational. The Splunk calls it the common information model. Um, so uh, what it is, uh, this is from the actual Splunk documentation. Uh, it's a set of field names and tags which are expected to define the least common denominator of a domain of interest. Um, basically, it's, it's a framework that Splunk has already built that um, allows you to pull in disparate data from diff disparate sources and pull it in together and distill it into areas of, of interest for you. Um, it basically breaks it out um, in two primary components, uh, tags, a set of tags, and then a set of extracted fields that go along with those tags. Um, it's its own application, uh, so you download it, it's a free app that Splunk produces, um, you install it, and it has all this stuff. Um, it is leveraged by a lot of other apps, um, like Splunk's own uh, enterprise security app, uh, various things, uh, some dashboards, they will leverage this. And it, it provides an awesome foundation. And the best thing about it is you can extend it. So how, whatever your environment needs, um, this application can be extended very easily. So um, I'm going to give uh, a couple of examples of how this works. Um, first, I'm going to use an authentication model. Uh, Again, this is all from uh, some of this is from Splunk's documentation, and then also how I've used it. Um, so some of the tags used here: the authentication, default, privilege. This is going to be where you send Active Directory logs, LDAP, um, Radius, TACAX, whatever authentication type event you ha you might have, um, firewall authentication, web application. Auth, whatever, whatever you've got, you can throw in into here. That, that's kind of the idea. Um, so then you can search with those tags um, once you've distilled all of that. For example, um, the default tag right there, that would be used for like a default credential, administrator credential or something logging in. Um, privileged user, that's a privileged user. Interesting, two, those two can really be extended by using um, input lookups in Splunk where you can pull in, um, you can pull in uh, like CSV files of people who might be privileged in your organization or default account credentials, um, default accounts you might have, and then these can leverage that. So basically, um, it'll just pull that in and you can do a search. So clear text, obviously, if something's clear text. And then some fields that are typically used with authentication, um, action, so is it successful or failure, um, source, the source of the authentication destination, where they authenticated, and the user. So down below, I have kind of a, uh, an example search. Everybody see that okay? Hoping. Um, so tag equals authentication and privileged, and then looking at the count by user, the action, and the source. Um, so, so a search like that, if you have 
all of your app, all of your information feeding it correctly, you should search for any sort of privileged authentication across all of your authentication events and sources. Um, another example would be IDS. Um, so again, uh, this is this data model is primarily defined for um, intrusion detection events, both network, host, application. So that might be a WAF, something like that. Um, and then typical fields used for that um, are going to be source test, right, severity, and the signature that might have been triggered, as well as IDS type. Um, so at the bottom there, I'm looking for IDS events that are network-based, that were critical across all of my devices. So I might have, you know, a Palo Alto firewall, maybe I've got some Cisco firewall with, with IPS somewhere, um, I've got a WAF, right, and I've got um, endpoint type IPS. Um, this would search across all of those. That's kind of the idea. Well, it would search over network based, based on the search. So um, components. So uh, custom application is primarily made up of these directories and then files in those directories. Um, the local app.conf and the metadata files I'm not going to cover um, today because of brevity, but they, those are just basically metadata, right? I mean, it's just information about your app, um, very basic stuff, what's it called, right? Who wrote it, that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to focus on the stuff under the default directory and the lookups directory, because um, that's really where the rubber hits the road with, with custom apps. So an example um, app.conf in the default directory, um, I'm going to use in all of this, I'm going to use just an example web application firewall custom app. Um, this is one that uh, I had to build at one point uh, because our ven the vendor didn't um, have a Splunk app. And oftentimes, even when the vendors do have Splunk apps, they don't conform to the common information model. And so I end up rewriting them anyway to fit that because that's kind of how um, my mind thinks. I, I can fit it under different domains, right? Access, um, network security, right? Uh, uh, account management, right? I can, I can start bucketing it um, that way. And a lot of times, vendors don't think that way. Um, so this is pretty basic. You know, is it configured? Is it enabled when you install it? Um, who the author is, version, and then is visible? Um, I usually use false. Um, that's going to be in the, in the Splunk UI up at the top left where you can click and is it going to show up in that drop down of apps. I usually don't do that because this is usually um, under the covers type stuff I'm doing. But if you hit true, it'll show up there. Um, event types. So now we're starting to get into a little bit of the meat. So event types are going to be where you identify certain searches that Splunk would do and you're going to basically generate meta information, an event type, that then be can become searchable. So take that f first one, um, WAF attack. So everything after the equal signs, so search equals, and then that's going to be the search within Splunk that you would do from a search field um, that would create that, that event type. Then I've got tags that are going to be associated with that event type. So take the next one down, um, the WAF admin activity. So here's one that I want to look for. It's the source type is whatever my WAF vendor is. Type equals event and then not user equals daemon because this product happened to do a lot of uh, activity via the daemon user. Um, I was looking for a specific admin activity, someone, some, one of our admins logging in and doing something. And then I'm calling, tagging it network and modify. Next one down, um, I'm looking for authentication events from an administrator. Um, and you'll notice I'm putting in there tags are going to be authentication, privileged, it's a network login, and I'm starting a session, okay? That's important because the next one down, I'm doing session end. Now, a lot, of, a lot of products do not 
when, when they log uh, a login, they, always, they don't always put in the length of the session when someone logs out. I know like some Cisco stuff does, but very little does. Uh, very few vendors do that. This lets you basically abstract away from that and use the timestamps that Splunk has to determine the duration of a session. Right? So I can say, I want to look for session end, session start, and I'm going to delta the time on that, and I know their duration. Make sense? So um, next is going to be the tags.conf file, and this is pretty self-explanatory. Basically lines up with going back to that events type. You, I have all the tags there and the event type name, so in the tags I've got event type equals the event type, and then the tags associated with that, and I'm enabling or disabling them. Um, that where it says in the brackets event type equals whatever, that now becomes a searchable field in Splunk. So when you're doing a Splunk search, you can type event type equals whatever, and it will automatically find whatever you've defined here. You don't have to remember everything that, that defined that event type. All right, so transforms. Uh, this, is, this is where the meat really is. So um, a couple examples here. Basically, the na whatever name you have in the brackets um, is only going to be relevant within your app. That doesn't matter to Splunk uh, internally. You can't search on that. Um, you can, so here I'm, uh, the top one, uh, WAF changes. I've got a regex that I'm looking for a specific log entry. Um, and then I've got parentheses because this is basically following Perl compatible regular expressions. And you can pull in those, any information in the parentheses as a variable. Then under format equals, um, I'm just saying the first item under parentheses is the field user. Next one is the field action, right? Next one's command. So now those become fields, like when you're in Splunk and you're looking at an event, and you have all the fields on the left side that you can search. These now become fields that are available to you, okay? Um, next one, WAF admin auth, you can see same thing, and I'm creating the, the fields there. Another example, um, I'm just calling it WAF event one, um, and you can see I can, I can chain a ton of these together um, and pull in a bunch of them. The bottom one I want to call special attention to, um, I, I've got format equals WAF underscore action. That's my own event or my own field name that I'm creating. Um, so you can see you can extend these, you can name them whatever you want. Um, I'm going to this, 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 uh, this web application firewall, the action that it took is something, what it put in the logs is something that I didn't really want to work with. So what I did is I created this, this one I named WAF action, and I'm now pulling that in as WAF, that, that field name. Then what I do is in the transforms.conf, I, I define a lookup, okay, and I, I label a file name, um, a CSV file because I want to remap these. What this, this product call, anytime there was an event, if it was an allowed event that the WAF did not block, it, it would log alert. If it was a blocked one, it would be alert underscore deny, um, which to me, those aren't really useful because I have other devices that use different nomenclature for, for how they allow, allow or block things. So in the CSV file that I just referenced in that lookup, it's really simple. I've got on the left WAF action, which I had defined in my transform when I extracted the field. And on the right, I've got action, okay, which is now for conforming to the common information model. And you can see I'm translating alert to allowed, alert denied to blocked, success to allowed, and I can add whatever I want here. So that way when I do a search for anything, an, you know, anything to do with the WAF, and I want to see whether it was allowed or not, I can just do action equals allowed, right, in my search. And then now that's going to do that. I don't have to remember what the nomenclature was per vendor that I have logging to Splunk. It's now normalized for me and my team. Yeah? So the WAF interaction, I was just saying the original, was just effectively how to transform to This one right here? Okay, here. So back here, I, I'm, I'm pulling it out of the, the log. Yep, and then here I'm uh, in the transforms.com file, just lower down, further down. I'm actually referencing a lookup and telling it here's the file that defines that lookup. How do you tell it's only good for that event type or is it good for anything? 
Um, because this, this file name is associated with this app. So this app and that WAF action shouldn't, if my regex is crappy, then th more things are going to get caught. But if you get your regex correct, then only events that match that regex should get defined as that field. No, because it's a different regex. Okay, so that answer your question? Okay, ask me afterward. So here's a, um, here's a, a different type. Um, this is a Palo Alto. So, um, so Palo Alto in their logs, they're just, their logs are basically just comma separated values. So it makes it really easy to bring into Splunk. Here I'm defining um, a key value pair. And I'm saying my delimiter, the thir third line down there, is a comma. And then those are the fields. So I don't have to do any regex. I'm just saying if it's just go through. If it's a field that I don't really care about, then I might just name it some nonsense uh, thing. Um, but I can pull it in. And now all of those fields become available in a Palo Alto threat thing right here. So then um, in the props.conf is where you use all of this. So that first line, uh, first couple lines, um, I'm defining the source type for this application. I'm calling it WAF source. Now you'll notice I'm not defining how that data is getting in. I'm doing that for this one via the data input Splunk has. So I'm just saying if it comes in on UDP port such and such, then define it as source type WAF source. And then my application looks for that sort. My application looks for that source type WAF source. And then that next line is now sh should line merge. Usually that's going to be false. Um, that's defining whether you're going to merge multiple lines. If you have an application that merge that has multiple lines that kind of come in in, in the logs, but really should be one lo lo item, then you can merge them. You make that true. Now it merges them together. So then um, here's where you're defining what's getting used um, for the application. All of the other stuff, you could do the work, and if you don't define it here, your application never sees it and Splunk never uses it. So you have to get your, your uh, you have to type the names correctly. Um, I've troubleshot a ton of things where I've basically fat fingered things and caused myself a lot of problems. So first, I'll take that first one, report WAF action equals WAF action. So the report tag is basically pulling in um, any of the items as I come back here. See, I've got this WAF event one. Any of those kind of items show up in the props.conf as report. And you can name them whatever you want. I usually keep the two the same so that um, I don't mistype things. So I'm pulling in the WAF action, the WAF event one, WAF changes, WAF admin auth. Those are all the transforms I did um, previously. Um, field aliases. So sometimes I can get um, maybe whatever application I'm pull whatever data I'm bringing in might have um, the field, the data in the field is, is correct, what I want, but the name of the field isn't matching what I want to use. So again, I want to map it to the common information model. So for example, the first field alias, uh, WAF device I'm calling it, um, this device actually had a field called dev name equals, and it would have whatever the device name was. Um, but that doesn't match common information model. Common information model wants DVC for device. So I'm just aliasing that over to dev name equals device. So um, all of those I can do that with. Um, you'll notice I didn't do that with action. Again, that's because the you'll only want to alias things where the field value matches what you want to have later in the application. Um, if the field alias, if the field value is not that way, then you need to do a lookup. And that's where you're basically rewriting that field information. So the bottom one, you see the lookup. I'm, named, I'm pulling from that WAF action lookup, and I'm taking the WAF action column from that CSV, and I'm outputting action, the action column. And that's, that's pretty much it. 
Um, here's a different example um, where I'm pulling from a source type, and I'm actually, a lot of times you'll have a lot of different devices. Maybe um, you can't change what port they log on, or, and they're just going to default to UDP 514 for syslog or something, and you can't change that port, or you can't put a, a forwarder on, on the device, whatever it might be. So here's an example where I'm taking syslog data, which maybe I have eight devices logging to syslog. Um, and I'm going to rip that out, and I'm going to re recategorize that to a specific source type. So this transforms. I'm forcing the source type to change from syslog to what I'm determining. And so in my transforms.conf, this is where I'm doing that. Um, I've got a regex that matches, needs to match all of the logs for that source type. If you don't, then you're going to end up some events from that source are going to be mapped to source type, whatever you define here, and some are going to be syslog, and you're going to get uh, incompatible data. So, and then I'm just formatting it as source type is whatever I decide. Um, so where do the files go? Uh, so they go in the Etsy apps and then whatever you name it. Um, Extracts are search time events, so they go on the search head. Um, and transforms are index time if, uh, extractions, so they go on the indexers. You'll notice I only, use, I only showed one example of transforms there. They're, they're rare. I don't use them a whole lot. But you can put, there's no harm in placing them on both, which is what I do. So I hate to get in the business of putting search stuff on the search head and index stuff on the index because I... I'm going to mess up. And my deployment server, this makes it easier for my deployment server to just push the app to both. So Splunk doesn't care, and it does the work for you in deciphering which one goes on which. OK, real quick. So how do I use that? So um, some tips here. Um, main thing here is to start asking questions. To decide, OK, I want to use, what, what question do I want to ask? What information do I need? And then build your app to pull that information in. I put avoid pie charts because data analysts hate pie charts. Human eyes can't tell the difference between the sizes. Okay, so a couple of exam some examples here. Um, on the right, I've just got a, a single pane from a dashboard um, that I pulled on March 8th. Um, this is authentication events, um, and I'm tracking access over time by action. So I'm only looking at success, success or failure. You can see there's a huge uh, increase in failures. What this ended up being is I could click on that and I could drill down and see what those are. But um, those were, we had a back-end process that um, the authentication mechanism changed and two systems didn't reflect that change and generated a crap ton of fail, authentication failures. Um, so I'm able to spot that. The search that generates that is over on the top left. I'm just, again, I'm looking at authentication events. Um, I've got two variables, action and user type, that you can see are drop downs in that dashboard on the right. And then I'm time charting. Um, that actually, that failure, um, those failure columns were both Windows events as well as web application logs on, um, on the back end. So um, I got both types on using the tag equals authentication. Another example below that, um, failed user accounts. Uh, I'm, Authentications and failures, and I'm sorting them. Um, or created enabled accounts. Again, I'm looking at, I've tagged it account, management, creation, and then I'm pulling in the information that I want, or sorting it however I want. Um, and that will pull in whatever. Somebody creates an account on the firewall, somebody creates an account in the database, somebody creates an account in Windows, or Interactive Directory, or whatever, it's going to grab all those. Here are a couple other examples. Um, this is URL filtering. So uh, we have URL filtering logs that are from different vendors. Um, I want them all, and they're in different data centers, and I want them all correlated together. So the top one there, I've got, um, I, I'm sorting it according to, um, on the y-axis, I've got users, x-axis count. I'm looking for stuff that has a lot of count and very few users. So I'm, I'm looking for things that look anomalous there. The bottom one, I've got um, be potential beaconing. So I'm looking for things that are um, URL queries that I'm looking at the, a delta between epic time. I'm using epic time, and I'm looking at a delta um, to determine something that's 
making the same request over and over and over again. And again, the useful thing about this is I'm doing this across all of my URL filtering logs, which are different vendors. Here are some resources. Um, I'm, gonna post the, I'm gonna post the slides, so you don't need to record all that. The bottom one is my favorite, PCRE test, for not screwing up your regex. Um, every Linux, Mac OS has it, so. Um, any questions? If you do, contact me. Any questions right now? I kind of blew through it, but okay, thanks.